Hi folks! In this tutorial we're going to be taking a look at creating thermal vision. Uh, this is a very popular type of rendering that you'll see in games all over the place. Um, everything from Fallout to Grand Theft Auto has this kind of effect in it. Um, I've just got a Google window open here, a image search, and I've just searched up for thermal vision uh, and just kind of taking a look at the effects that you see. This is what we're going to be trying to reproduce in Unreal 4. Uh, now, not all of these obviously are uh, legitimate um, thermal vision as viewed through a scope. Um, a lot of these are actually, you know, uh, this here is actually uh, Fallout, and uh, this looks like Grand Theft Auto. No, that's, yeah, that's Grand Theft Auto. Um, and so you get the idea. There's, there's actually a few of these here that are not uh, legitimate thermal vision, uh, though some of them are. The, the image that I started on, this one here, um, is actually for a scope for a firearm, and this one is um, legitimate thermal vision. Uh, these are different modes uh, that you'll get when viewing things through thermal vision. You'll get uh, different kind of effects here depending on the the color uh, scheme that you use and uh, they use these things for different reasons. Um, every now and then you'll get uh, a different color gradient that just doesn't work for what you're trying to look at. Um, and so a lot of these thermal scopes will have the ability of cycling through different uh, color effects when you put them on. Um, while these all look really drastically different, uh, when putting them together in an engine like Unreal, they're actually all identical. Um, there's a single variable that we're going to change uh, that will allow us to uh, effectively change what the render looks like. Um, you can see we've got one here where it's white, it's hot, and then an inverted version of that that's black, that's hot. And uh, we've got the rainbow version down here. And uh, all of these things are just kind of using these different gradients. And so what we're going to do is we're going to be using a image map to map out this gradient. And then we'll just tell the engine how to apply that gradient to what's being rendered. This means that by simply changing the gradient, we change how the render looks. Um, I've gone and grabbed a bunch of images already. Um, these are ones that I kind of like the uh, look of, and I, I also tried to grab some that were uh, different from one another. Um, so I'll just kind of show you what these look like here at first uh, before we dive into Unreal. So this one here is uh, air temperature in millibars, and it starts off at kind of a very dark purple and kind of goes into this uh, violet color before dipping into very dark blues and light blues and greens and yellows and oranges and reds is essentially uh, just the rainbow kind of thing that you would get with ultraviolet infrared. Um, this looks very much just like the color spectrum. The next one I've got is uh, a little bit different in that once we dip down into the, um, the purple range here, this one actually bleeds out into white. Uh, meaning that all of the coldest areas here are actually going to become white, um, followed by that purple range and then into the blues and whatnot. So you can see that kind of effect here. The next is using complementary colors here or uh, somewhere thereabouts. It's a uh, yellow and purple scheme that we're kind of looking at here. So you get this uh, yellowy orange effect where things are hot. Uh, and then the opposing side of the spectrum, the blues and the violets here, uh, indicating where things are at their coolest. Uh, this one too is pretty cool. Uh, now the other thing that I've grabbed here, the, the, the reason I've grabbed these images, uh, each and every one of them, uh, as well as having some kind of a display here showing us what these gradients look like when applied to an image, uh, in this case it's actually just a graph, they also contain the gradient all by itself. And that's actually why I've grabbed these. I'm just going to take the gradient directly from there. Now, I, I, you don't need reference images for gradient. You can just make up your own. Um, you know, it's, it's not that complex. But since these are all um, gradients that have to do with thermal vision, um, I did want to grab these so that I could, um, you know, get something that is going to appear as realistic as possible. Um, this one here, you can see the, the blues have no violet in them, and instead, after red here, we get into kind of pinks and whites as well. Um, this looks a little bit more uh, akin to what you would get with metal heating up, right, where you get white hot and red hot, and then yellows and greens and blues as it cools down. Um, 
And then this one I really liked as well. Uh, there are two of them in here. Uh, and I just like them because of how different they were. Um, this one, which is a little similar to one of the other ones here, where it's yellow for hot into reds and then violets and then blues and then into whites for the cool. Uh, and then this one, which is completely just blues, greens, and whites. And uh, you get this very cool gradient. Um, so what I'm going to do is, uh, to begin with, I'm going to pull these into Photoshop. Um, and we'll just go in and create some images that we can use for our effect. So uh, let's begin with, uh, I'll grab this one to begin with. Uh, I really do like this one. So this is the uh, complementary colors here. Um, there are some, you can see some temperatures here. We're going to, for the most part, ignore that. Now I'm going to use my selection marquee and I'm just going to grab the gradient itself. Uh, now once I've gone and selected this, I do want to make sure that unlike what's happened here, I'm not actually selecting any of the, the pixelized areas. Um, in all actuality, what I really need is only just a single pixel of this. Um, what this is going to do is it's going to get rid of any of the artifacting that exists in this image. So these were just grabbed from the internet using Google, um, which means that they're going to have a little bit of artifacting in them. And so the idea here, yeah, that's pretty decent. So I'm going to copy that and we'll go make a new image and I'll just use the clipboard here for the dimensions of that image. And then we'll go and place this in place. So something like that. So there's my gradient now. And it's only a single pixel in width, um, which is going to be all right. Um, I'm going to rotate this counterclockwise. Now, this has actually got a pretty important reason for it. Um, the way that we're going to set up these materials, the way that we want to set these up, um, is so that when we get them in the engine, um, we're going to be dealing with hot at the left-hand side and cold at the right-hand side. And so I want to set up all my gradients so that they uh, they are headed in that direction. I don't want to invert them because what we'll end up doing is we'll get something more like a cool vision where uh, we're using cool colors for anything that's hot and hot colors for anything that's cooled, which is going to not look correct. Now that I've pasted this, I'm going to go into the image and uh, let's go and look at the image size here. Because we're going to be using this in Unreal, we need this to be base 4. So 224 is not base 4. I'm going to scale this up to 256. Now, usually you don't want to scale things up. Um, this is going to increase the amount of artifacting where it's trying to create more pixels from uh, none or from the limited number that exists. But I'm going to actually be doing a little bit more to this image, which should nullify the fact that I am scaling this up. And then what I'm going to do, I while I did just capture a single pixel in height, which is good, um, it's going to make it a little bit hard to see what I'm doing. So I'll increase the height of this to 16 pixels so I can I can still see my gradient. This is going to allow me to see if anything is kind of looking out of place. And what I would really kind of like to avoid are some of the banding issues that I'm getting kind of the, the, the low end or the cool end of this thing. Uh, if I look at the gradient here within the, uh, the white to yellow range, this looks really kind of smooth to me and it gets, you know, into the oranges and into the peach color. And then it's somewhere around here that it appears to lose that and we start seeing these kind of lines appear. Um, so my simple fix for this is I'm just going to run a filter on this and we'll use the Gaussian blur. And I don't want to blur it too much that we end up losing some of our main tones. But uh, if I look at this now, it is starting to appear to me to be very smooth in this gradient. So I'll say OK. Uh, now that should nullify any of the artifacting that occurred from rescaling this thing. So I'll go and save this out. In uh, I've got the uh, folder selected here. I'm going to save it as a targa. And I'll call this thermal ramp 01. Uh, and we'll be able to make as many of these as we want. Uh, I'll save it as 24-bit. We don't need an alpha channel with this. Uh, and that should be good for the uh, for the ramps. Um, that's really the only texture I'm going to be using in the uh, creation of this effect. So we'll leave that like that. I'll come back to this uh, folder here and we'll, we'll do a little bit more of these. Now, I'm starting at uh, an empty world here. I'm going to actually do absolutely everything from the ground up. So this is going to be starting with, we'll do a third person um, project here. Uh, I am going to put this in my projects and we'll call it thermal, like so. 
Uh, I'm going to add project here just because I might reuse the word thermal a lot. Um, and so I would like to make sure that uh, that is uh, a little bit more identifiable. Uh, I don't need the starter content and we will do desktop console and maximum quality. So I'll go and create this project and uh, we'll let Unreal open up. Huzzah. All right. So um, to kind of take a look at uh, the things that we're going to need to do here, if we kind of analyze what needs to be done, we need some way of identifying that which we want to be hot everything we can assume is cold we just really need to identify the hot things we don't need to identify the cold things if we identify what's hot everything else must be cold so that will make life a little bit simpler um i'll just dismiss this here and i'll pop open my content okay um i'm gonna do a few changes to the world here the default world that exists just to make my life a little bit simpler. So first thing, I don't really need these extra walls here. Um, I'm not, I don't care if I fall out of the world. I'll, I'm going to be in control of the character here. And so uh, I don't really need him to uh, not fall away. That's fine. Uh, I'll get rid of the help. I don't need that. And the text on the ground here I won't need. And I'm going to go rescale the ground plane just so I have a little bit more room to run around. By default, it's not at its full scale. Um, and so I will go scale it up, Ooh, not 10, let's just do one. Um, that'll give me just a little bit more area than what I had originally. Now in doing so, um, I've gone and destroyed the light map that exists for this. So I'll just go and rebuild my lighting. Uh, I'll let that go. And that should snap these shadows back to underneath the boxes. Um, I it really bothers me when I have things that aren't rendered correctly. I don't really need to do this to make the effect uh, however, I do want to uh, be able to, you know, have a good look at what's going on. Okay. Now, if we look up in the sky here surrounding the world, uh, right away there's something that we need to take a look at, which is the post-process volume. You can find this by just typing in post into the outliner and finding the one that exists in the world. Now, if you're working on your own project, you're working on something that uh, you've made yourself, um, you are going to want to make sure that you are... Um, placing one of these in your world. This is going to make sure that uh, you have the ability of adding a post-process effect to the world. So the post-process volume here, which is the pink one that surrounds the world, has got some settings, if we look at the detail pane, that are going to be important to us. Uh, right now, most of everything is turned off, which is good. There is one thing that we need to take a look at, which is this setting right here under post-process volume settings, something called unbound. Now, what Unbound does is it allows this post-process volume um, to not contain the post-process, meaning if I were to exit the volume, that post-process is still going to be turned on. So if I turn off Unbound here, you'll see the sky change ever so slightly. And as I enter the volume, it, uh, it should go back. If you want to see this a little bit clearer, I'll, uh, I'll go into the color grading and we'll go and reduce the uh, where are you, color grading. And we'll go and adjust the uh, saturation here. So I'll just set the saturation on each of these channels to be zero. So there's zero saturation. So you can see now the volume is controlling whether or not this effect is turned on. Meaning we have to be inside the volume for the volume to be doing what we want it to do. If we head back down to the unbound and we tick that, now when I leave the volume, it doesn't matter. The process is not bound to the confines of the volume, and we can leave the volume and still have this effect turned on. There are really good reasons for wanting to do this. Um, I'm not going to be setting this up as a, uh, as a scope with a weapon or anything like that. We're, we're just going to make it render like this in the world. Um, but there are a couple of reasons that you would want to use Unbound or not use Unbound. Reasons are things like what you're going to be using this post-process for. So, for instance, if your post-process is meant to look like you were underwater, then it's probably not something you want to keep unbound. It's probably something you want to have bound to the confines of a volume, and then you would place that volume exactly where your water in your world is, uh, which would allow players to uh, get the effect of being underwater while they're underwater. When you leave the confines of the water, you 
are also leaving the confines of the volume, thus turning off the effect. You could also do something similar to this um, if you were doing a scope on a, on a gun. You know, you would want some, um, some way of turning on or off this effect. And we can set that up as we do this. The other thing that we're going to take a look at here, so my unbound is turned on, meaning if this will happen whether or not we're inside the volume, which is good. Uh, I'm going to go and turn the saturation back up since I don't actually want it to be grayscale in my world. Uh, the other thing that we're going to be taking a look at here is how we're going to be doing this post-process. So all of these settings that exist in the, uh, the editor here uh, all affect how the engine is going to render um, what you see on screen and this is good you can go and play around with the contrast and the saturation and all kinds of really fun things however what we really want to do is we want to put in a um, an image into this so the way these images are going to work essentially we're going to use a material to determine how this is going to be rendered now the materials um, are going to go into something called blendable so if we go look for um, blend, uh, we can find post-process material uh, that does not actually appear to be there. They might have changed it. So uh, I'm actually using version 4.15.1 uh, um, in case you were trying to follow along. Uh, these settings might be in different places if you're using different versions of the engine. And, uh, and so that appears to be the case here from the last time I did this. And so I'm just going to go look around to see where they've moved what it is that I'm looking for. So it is not in the uh, color grading. It is not in the tone mapper. It does not appear to be in the lens. Although we'll take an extra look here just to make sure. Lens flares, it shouldn't be in there. Tinting uh, it doesn't appear to be in there. Depth of field, it doesn't need to be in there. Um, advanced, no. Rendering features, post-process materials, here we go. Okay, this is what I was looking for. Um, so the blendables, it looks like it's actually called materials here now. At one point it was called blendables. Uh, but this is what we're looking for, post-process materials. And in here is an array, which is a collection of objects. Uh, in this case, that collection has zero. Uh, there's nothing in here. And uh, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be creating a material and we're going to plug that material in here. So the f easy way to do this, let's go to our regular content here and I'm going to create a new folder and I'll call this effects since this will contain um, an effect. Inside this, I'll create a new folder, a new folder and I'll call this thermal vision effects. And inside here, um, let's first, let's bring in our, uh, our image here. So I'll go and create another folder here. Uh, and this will be called textures. Okay, and inside this, we'll import. Um, if I go to my projects and I scroll down here to thermal reference and my gradient that I just made in Photoshop is here. So there's my gradient now, um, which looks pretty good. I'm going to go back into the thermal vision, so that texture is in here, and I'll go and create a new folder once again, which I'll call materials. We're going to have a few materials that we're going to create here, so this folder is going to be of importance. And inside here, let's go create, um, actually, let's not create anything yet. Let's go to the, uh, the array. Let's add a new uh, element, and that element is going to be, actually, let's go create a material. Okay, so here's our material. Um, thermal vision and I'm going to start this with a um, prefix of capital P capital P uh, this is post process thermal vision now usually I like to do um, prefixes like this because they allow me to uh, sort things rather easily so if I was in a folder that had a lot of materials in it, 60, 70 different materials or whatnot, uh, I can identify the post process ones by just searching for the prefix of PP for post-process and only my post-process ones would show up. Um, I do the same thing with materials. Materials, I generally will start with the prefix MA and material instances will get MI and so on and so forth. Um, that way I can identify them by themselves. It makes uh, it makes searching a little bit easier. Okay, so here's the, uh, the thermal vision that we've got. Uh, and the idea with this is that we are going to... Um, 
go into this object. So let me go, and it's just appeared on the other window here, so I'll go drag it back over. So here's the material editor um, as it opens by default. Now the engine has no idea that this material is supposed to be used for a post-process. We just created a generic material, and so we need to tell the engine why we want this, uh, or what we want this material to be used for. So by default, the domain is for a surface, and that's not correct. We're going to switch this to be a post-process. Now when you do this, you'll notice that your preview sphere is now black, um, and that we've lost all of our inputs here in the material down to just the emissive color. That's the only input we are going to use, and we'll use that to kind of identify um, the renders. Now, we need to use a few nodes here that don't fully exist in the regular material editor or aren't used in the regular material editor, and we'll, we'll plug those into here. So I'm going to do a couple of things first, and we'll kind of take a look at how these nodes work. Um, the nodes in question, the ones that we're interested in, there's a couple of them here. Uh, we want the scene um, texture. So this guy is essentially what the game engine is rendering every frame. And uh, this is kind of cool. If we go down here uh, into its properties, the scene texture ID, uh, we can actually have this thing render out any of these different types of materials here. Um, so let's take a look at how this is going to work. If I grab the color node, and I plug this into the emissive color, um, you know, it'll tell me right away that scene color is not available. Um, scene color lookups are only available when mo material domain is surface. Uh, post-process materials should use the post-process input zero. So let's go use post-process input zero. This is going to essentially give us the same thing. This is going to give us color, but this works with post-process instead of a surface. Okay, so I've got that saved, so I'm just going to move this uh, out of the way here for a moment. And we'll go back to our post-process volume. We've got an array here. Um, and we've got a single element. I hit the little plus to add a single element to the array. And I'm going to click the little choose down here, and we're going to use an asset reference. So I'll click on that. And now we need to choose the asset. So if I click in the drop-down menu, you can see our PP Thermal Vision is right here. So when I click on this... Um, that should be it. We're actually now using the material. Now, let's do a check to make sure that this is actually doing what we want it to do. Um, since I'm actually just taking the single uh, color that comes out of the engine and telling it to do that, we're not actually processing anything. Um, we're just taking uh, a render of the engine and rendering it again. So let's go and add a desaturation node, and we'll use this to test whether or not we're actually post-processing. So I'm just going to create a desaturation and I'm going to put a constant 1 into the fraction here and I'll give this a value of 1, meaning this, is, this will desaturate 100%. So when I save this now, we should get grayscale in the world. So excellent, our material is doing exactly what we want it to. Now if you've ever played around with a material editor, which I'm hoping at this point you would have, um, you get essentially all of the same nodes here that we would use normally when creating materials in um, Unreal to affect the render. Um, some of them don't work, some of them don't work as well, some of them aren't really applicable, um, but there are a host or a wealth of these things that we can use uh, that are going to be really, really interesting. Okay, so this is our main um, output from the engine here that we're going to render, and we can go and affect how this is being rendered by plugging this out. What we're going to do is we're going to create uh, another node here. I'm going to show you another one that's really useful. So this too is another scene node, but this one is going to be the um, scene depth. Now this scene depth uh, is going to output, you can see, just a single color. See this red here? Uh, these ones are white, meaning this is RGB. This one is red, meaning it's just the red channel or it's just a um, single channel here. Um, so what this guy does, if we, uh, we go and plug this into the emissive color um, and apply this, you'll actually see that we just get flat white. Now the reason for this is that the range of numbers that we're getting pumped out of this, um, we can't actually see them returning any values. And so as I rotate this around here, all we're seeing is just white. The values are just too large. So if we go and divide this down, and let's divide it by something like 1,500. 
that's going to take those really large values that are being returned from here and it'll bring them back down into something a little bit more manageable. Cool, so now you can see what this is doing. Uh, the scene depth is giving us a return of, you know, some value for uh, up above white, up here, up above one. And when things are right at the camera, if I get right close to this guy, we can actually make him turn black. So there's a little bit of a black range here, um, which is pretty cool. Um, this division uh, is actually going to give us the range here. So if I bring this to 2,000 and save it again, we should see the contrast change here. And you can see we get a little bit more darks up close and that white is still really beaming far away. But this gives us essentially this ability to pick things near and far from the camera. So that's a pretty useful one as well. Another one we're going to take a look at is inside the scene uh, texture as well. Now this one uh, is not post-process input zero, so we're going to remove this. And the one that we're interested in here is called custom depth. So this node here returns the depth of everything being rendered. The custom depth, which I've gone and selected here, which we would need to do our same division in order to see this. Um, so I'll put this in here. We'll use that same 2000 so we can see this. And I'm going to go plug this into the emissive color. Now, when I save this, we're actually not going to see anything here. And the reason for that is that nothing in the world currently is being told to use a custom depth. Okay, so we need to change that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the third person character here. Um, I've got them selected now. You can see the third person character in the details pane. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go edit the blueprint for this. So let's open the blueprint editor. Okay, so here's all of the inputs for the control and whatnot of the character. We don't need to actually script anything for this to work. Um, the construction script looks empty. There's nothing in here. The viewport, this is what we are interested in. So in the viewport, we can see all the components that make up this uh, particular blueprint. So there's a capsule component. This is the outer shell here that determines where this guy is. An arrow component, which currently uh, in, is sticking out of his gut here, uh, indicating the direction that he's facing. That is parented to the capsule. Parented to the capsule as well is the mesh. And this is a skeletal mesh that's using an animation blueprint. And then here's the animation blueprint here. Here's the skeletal mesh in question with the materials this fella is using. We've also got a camera boom and a follow camera. So these are the um, the things that allow us to actually kind of play how this is working. So the boom is this extender here that's kind of what the camera is uh, selected or connected to. And then there's the, um, the camera itself that's going to follow around the character. What we're interested in is this fella right here. So this is the mesh component. And... The mesh is rather important because of all these things present um, in the components, the mesh is the one that's going to get rendered. So it's actually its properties that we're currently interested in. So in the details pane here, I'm going to go down to the area called rendering. There it is there. And we'll open that up. And what we want to go and do in the rendering is we want to go find the section that's called render custom depth pass and set this to be true. I'm going to save that and we can now close that. We don't actually need it anymore. And let's go back into our post process material. And I'm just going to connect this back up and now you'll see what's going on here is it's actually giving us the depth for that character. Now, right away, it looks like it's actually just... Um, oops, I lost him. Uh, it actually looks like um, it's connected to him. Um, there he is, third person. So it's actually looking uh, a little bit like um, he's just outlined in black and the world is in white. Uh, but this, this is a little deceiving. Um, what happens here, if I pull the camera back, you can see he actually 
will get lighter and lighter and lighter as he fades away. And so what this is doing is this is giving us the depth, but only the depth of this element. So that's cool. That means that we can use this in a way to manipulate our world. Now, what we need to do here is three things. We need three different components in order to make this work correctly. We're going to need some way of defining um, in the world that which should be hot. We need to define what hot looks like and we need to define what cold looks like. So those are the three elements we're gonna need. Let's start off by creating the element that's going to determine whether or not um, an object is hot. So here's my custom depth. And uh, yeah, that's fine. I think I'm gonna take a copy of this here too. So here's the custom depth. So if you remember, this is what's making the character mesh um, have a grayscale value on him. The other thing that we've got here is the the scene as it renders normally. And that's not actually what I'm interested in. I'm going to switch this to the scene depth. Now the scene depth is this node here. This is essentially the exact same thing. These two things output the same, or sorry, these two things will output the same thing. Um, it makes no difference if I use one or the other. Uh, I like to uh, I like to use the um, the scene texture uh, only because I'm I'm kind of referencing the same thing here all the time. But there's there's no, really no difference. Well, there will be one difference. Uh, if you recall, the scene depth is just the red channel. This one is not red. This is an RGB, which means the first thing I'm going to need to do here is put a component mask on this and stop the red. Um, so in actuality these two nodes are identical to this one. Um, I just like using the same scene texture. There's, it's just a personal preference thing. Okay, so here's the scene depth, and here is our character depth, or what we've chosen to turn this effect on. Um, let's mask this one out as well, since we're only interested in just a black and white value here. We'll use the red channel. Now these are uh, grayscale images, and so it doesn't really matter which channel you use. They're all identical in a grayscale image. Uh, I just generally use the red channel here as a preference. Um, the other thing that we want to do is we want to... Now, these two things, if we look at them combined, this custom depth node is the depth that exists in here, but only on selected meshes we want to be able to pull this out from here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase how large this depth is. I'm going to do that by creating an add node. And we'll add to the scene depth a value of one. This means that wherever the depth is on this object, it's higher than where the depth is on this object. Remember that this is just a cutout of selected meshes from this one. This one is now one higher than whatever the depth is in this one. So we've now got two values that are similar but different. This means that we can now choose to identify one or the other. The way we do that is using an if statement. So I'm going to create an if. We'll use our world depth as the A and we'll use our mesh depth as the B. Now the way this if works is we now get to define what happens when a is larger than b, a is equal to b, or a is less than b. So what I'll do is uh, let's go and put a couple of constants in here, and we'll set 1 to 1, and we'll set 1 to 0. So this is effectively white and black. So if we make everything in which our world is a larger value than our custom node, our selected meshes, we'll make that white. And anywhere where the opposite is true, we'll make it black. Let's render this and see if the effect is doing what we want it to. So I'll just plug this into the emissive. And I'll save this here so we can see an update in the world. And what we end up with is our character mesh rendering as white 
and the world rendering as black. This is also known as a mask. We've now been able to isolate a single mesh. So that's ideal. I'm going to go do something here that's just going to make my life a little bit simpler for now. We're going to reverse this in a moment, but I'm going to go back into my post-process volume. And one of the things that I'd like to do here is turn off the unbound. And the reason I want to turn that off is so that if I exit the world or exit the volume, I can turn on and off the effect. This is just going to make it a little bit easier to select other things in the world. Now, the reason I want to select other things in the world here uh, is to give you an example of another thing that we can do. So let's say that this box uh, that's sitting here over to the side um, was something else that you wanted to have lit up. Say in your world you had a, uh, a generator, an electric generator or something like that, or the engine from a car or whatnot. Then this too would show up in our thermal vision, which means we need to add it to the white mask. So for any mesh that exists in your world, when you go to its properties, we just go down to the rendering section. Everything will have this rendering section and we'll go and pull this open. And if we go look down in here, we'll also have render custom depth pass. And if I turn this on and we drop back into the world, this has now been added to our scene. Excellent. So we've accomplished the first feat we needed. This is to make some way of identifying what is hot and what is not. Now what we need to do is determine what happens when we do make things hot. How to affect how things are hot and how they are not. Okay, so to do this, we're going to create two chains. Now, I'm going to do something that's kind of interesting with these two chains here, which is I'm going to duplicate them. Um, and we'll use one um, for hot and one for cold. Now, if you remember what's going on in the uh, ramp here, let's go take a look at one of these ramps again. So I'm going to go back into the thermal vision textures and we'll double click on this guy. So here's our ramp. And if I take somewhere about the middle point of this ramp, everything to the left of that is hot. Everything to the right of that is cold. Now, I want to take a look at some UV information here that is going to be of particular interest to us at the moment. So I've just got a little utility here. It's going to allow me to draw on screen. This corner right here is 0, 0. Okay, This is the UV coordinate for this corner. And the UV coordinate for this corner, the top right corner, is 1, 1. Okay, This is where we get that 0 to 1 box. What we need to do is we need to split this in half. That means the area that we're interested in of here is 0.5, right? 0 to 0 0.5, 0 0.5 to 1. So 0 to 0.5 is going to be hot. And 0.5 to 1 is going to be cool. So we're going to use a single image, this guy, and we'll map everything that's hot to the first part of the ramp and everything that's cold to the later part of the ramp. So what we need to do is we need to split our image in half. Okay, so that's the most important thing right now. So let me clear this. Uh, clear, clear, clear. Clear, and I'll turn this off. Okay, um, so what we're going to do is... Um, bring that heat ramp in here. All right, here's our heat ramp. So what I want to do with this, uh, first and foremost, is make it a parameter. This way we'll be able to manipulate it down the road. So we'll give it a name, and this is the thermal color ramp. That way we can go and make an instance of this entire material chain, and we'll be able to swap out this single image uh, as I told you, we are going to be using um, a single variable that will determine what that look is. This is that single variable. Okay, let's look at how we're going to split those UVs in half. Well, here's my UVs. And as it turns out, if we multiply these UVs by, well, if we multiply them by 1, they stay the same. We multiply them by 0.5, they're now halved. 
So this should only give us the first half of these UVs. Okay, so that part's easy. We've now gone and broken those up. The next thing we're going to do is, um, using our scene texture, we'll start kind of processing um, this effect to put it where we want it to go. So here's our scene that gets rendered. Okay, this is the single frame that gets popped out. Let's take out this color and mask it. Okay, component mask, and we'll just allow the green channel in. Okay, so this has now, or sorry, the red channel. So what this has done is it's taken this color image and we've made it down to a single grayscale image. Uh, now this is different than desaturation. De desaturation is still RGB. This is a now single number. Okay, so that's kind of important. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in a power node and the power node here is going to give us a level of um, contrast on this image. So the grays and the blacks and whites that get spit out of this, uh, this node is going to help us control those. So I'm going to create a uh, scalar parameter here and we'll just go name this scalar parameter. Um, uh, not scalar parameter, that would be foolish. Um, power exp for exponent. Um, and we'll give it a default value of 1, just so that we're not multiplying by 0 here, or something by itself no times, which would be bad. This can then go into our multiply. So this takes whatever's in the world, reduces it down to a single black and white image, which we can then use this to adjust the contrast of. This then gets cut in half and plugged into the UVs. Let's also try and adjust a little bit of how bright we make this thing in the end. So I'll pull this out and we'll also multiply this by another scalar. Oops, that is not a scalar. There we are, scalar parameter. Uh, and we'll call this scalar parameter color multiplier. Now these are going to give us a fine level of control over what these colors look like. So that, that should be it. That should be the heat color of our render. So let's give this a whirl. Let's see if this works. So I'm going to plug it in here. I'll, I'll bring this down here so we can actually see this happen real time. So I'll go position the camera a little bit better so we can see these two objects. Okay, so I'll save to update, and that should update the render. And just like that, we're getting this Dante's Inferno look at everything being essentially comprised of these beginning colors in the UV palette. Right on. Looks pretty good. Now, if you look at how this guy is being rendered, he's actually just been tinted. Right, he's not actually looking like he's uh, hot in any way. In fact, if you look at where the white is and where the red is, his back appears to be cooler than his chest, uh, and the seams inside his outfit actually appear to be um, hotter than anything else. And that's not the way therm uh, thermal version uh, vision works. Uh, assuming this guy was human and not a robot, uh, his core temperature would actually be a lot higher, and he would be cooler around the extremities. And so, what we need to do is we need to change the way that this fellow is being rendered. So what this is going to do is this is going to um, create a second material on him. Before we do that though, let's go and create the third element that's needed here. Now before I do anything, so we don't lose track of what these things are, I'm going to give them comments. So I'm going to select all the nodes at the bottom and hit C. This is going to allow me to create a comment. Um, and this is going to be uh, mask. I'll select the area we just made and I'll hit C and this is going to be hot and now what I'll do I'm going to select this entire chain and I'm going to duplicate it whoops that wasn't not duplicate there we are duplicate so I'll place this one above here and this one is not hot but cool okay let's plug the cool chain in and let's look at once again our image in Photoshop or let's do it back in here again I'll just crack this image open again so when we looked at the drawing um, that was here a moment ago where we looked at the 0 to 1 right so this over here let me turn this on 
Let me switch this to white. There we go. Okay, so this here is 0, comma, 0. And this, again, is 1, comma, 1. So u and v of 0, 0 and 1, 1. We've gone and split this in half. So we did that by multiplying by 0.5. This took 1 and shrunk it down to here. So the engine thinks that this texture is 0 to 1 going to this point. If we want to take this entire color spectrum that we've just done and we want to move it from there to there, well, it should be fairly simple. 0 is the beginning. 0.5 is the end. If we need to make this, 0.5 is the beginning and 1 is the end, we just look at how we get from one to the other. To get from 0 to 0.5, we're going to add 0.5. To get from 0.5 to 1, we're also going to add 0.5. So cool. The answer is we just need to add 0.5. So I'll delete this. And if we go back into our material here, so here's our cool vision. All I'm going to do, I'm going to back these up a little bit to make a little bit more room in here. I'll put this guy down here. So there's our multiply of 0.5 that's shrinking the UVs down. And if I just hold A and click to get an add, and we add to our UVs 0.5, this should now give us the cool spectrum of that image. So when I apply this, it'll take a moment, and there is now the cool side of things. Now this one looks a little bit funny only because uh, in this particular image that red appears about in the center. Um, this is why you're going to want to use multiple images here and why you're going to want to take a look at uh, doing this multiple different ways or with multiple different images so that you can actually fine tune this to a point that you think it looks right. For instance, uh, when I look at this it actually looks like this could be the entire heat value um, without seeing that yellowy white in there we have a really hard time uh, determining just what values we're looking at however we can now go and build the entire look here so this is a fairly simple thing to do uh, i'm going to create a linear interpolation and we're going to choose cool as the base hot as the addition and our little mask is going to determine where we render each so if i plug this into our missive and again i'll pull this down so we can see the update and we should get hot fella in the middle of a cool world. Same thing with our box that we went and manipulated as well. In fact, anything that we render in this way um, is going to, if we turn that rendering flag on and off on this guy, uh, we'll actually see him. Where's his rendering here? Uh, rendering, there it is right there. So you can see we can actually make that thing hot or cold just by simply uh, applying that. All right, I'm going to change some numbers here now or some names here now in my materials just to make things a little bit simpler. So I went and created this power exponent and this color multiplier. Uh, in duplicating those, uh, it just put an underscore one here. So I'm going to go rename these to something that makes a little bit more sense. So this is going to be cool power exponent. And this will be cool color multiplier. like so. Uh, I'll go rename these ones as well, even though they didn't get the underscore. Um, hot. And this one as well. Hot. I also want to take this color ramp, and I want to make sure it is indeed an instance of this one, so that when I change one, they both change. Otherwise, we'll, we'll be using two different image ramps, one for the hot, one for the cold. And if that were the case, we would actually just create two images, which we don't want to do. So I'll save this out, make sure we have no errors, which we currently do not. We'll go back and look at our world, and it is rendering exactly the way we'd like it to. With the exception of the fact that this guy is still not done the right way. Let's take a look at making him render the right way. Now, this is going to be a little bit funny, uh, only because I'm not going to go and edit this guy's materials, though um, this is something you would want to do with your own meshes. 
So I'm going to go into my materials folder here and I'm going to create a couple of things. Now these are not going to be straight up materials. Uh, I'm first going to create a material function. So this material function, let's call this um, thermal texture, like so. Uh, this is a material function, so I'll use mf for that prefix. Again, allowing me to search for these. I'm going to go to the material function and you'll notice that right off the bat we have a single output. Okay, this is different than a regular material. Um, this allows us to do all kinds of different things in here and pump this out to an output. We can then call this function inside of a material. So what I want to do is I do want to build a material in here, even though I don't have the outputs. So the way I'm going to do that is by making the outputs. So I've gone and created a make material attributes. This you should recognize as being what you normally see inside of a regular material. Now when I plug this in here, it's now applying the default values to each of these nodes into this output. Now, the only thing that we're really interested in here is the emissive color. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a material now that allows us to make the core of his body hotter than the perimeter. And this is actually a fairly simple thing called a Fresnel. So here's the Fresnel. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to, again, give myself a little bit of a control over this. So uh, let's create a power. And I'll plug this into, where's there's the emissive. Okay. So you can see what this has done, how this is being rendered. We are getting a um, white perimeter and a black interior. The other thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to play around with the exponent on this Fresnel. I'm going to do that by adding a... Um, constant one here and as I drop this number down I actually don't want to be above zero or uh, below zero uh, but what this is going to allow me to do you can see that black is a pinpoint hole uh, and as this number gets larger there's point one that black spot gets larger um, let's set our power to one just until we get this set up the right way here uh, and I believe let's try 0.5 and see how that works not quite there. There's not enough black there yet. Let's try 0.75. Okay. That's starting to look a little bit better. So I've got enough black here. And what's more important is I want that single pixel at the center to be black um, and the perimeter to be white. So if I go and change my power now to a 2, you can see what we're getting now. It's a nice black core with that white perimeter. That's it. I'm going to save this function. Excellent. The other thing that we would need to do here is uh, create another um, material for this guy. Um, this would be his normal, regular, everyday texture. Um, this guy already has some. His are in the character material folder. Uh, you can see he's actually got some materials here. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'll just make a very quick version of this um what am i looking at here material layering not what i want this guy is the instance let's go to the materials uh there's a bunch of functions there are his textures there okay so this appears to be his main body um they're doing a lot of blending here um this is a very clever way of doing materials in Unreal. It allows you to get a really nice high up resolution based off um, tiling a, uh, a repeating material. Um, so we're not going to use his. What I'm going to do is I'll just make kind of another material function here that we'll, we'll pretend is his real one. Um, again, if this was my own asset, I would actually have my own materials and textures to use here. So again, a MF for material function, and this is going to be um, normal texture okay in the normal texture uh, we're going to repeat the same thing here we're going to make a material attribute this one and I'll plug this in uh, and then this is where you would actually build all the materials for your character uh, I don't actually have materials for this guy so we'll go in just create some fake ones here so we'll make him I don't know gray there we go. He's got a normal texture. His normal texture is just going to be gray. Okay. So now we've got those two different materials here. What we need uh, to do is we need to create a material 
that's going to allow us to pick which one of these different looks, the normal version or the thermal version, gets applied to our character. To do this, we're going to go create a material. This material, I'll call it hero material. And again, I'll use my prefix. This is an MA for material. Uh, and in this guy, we here don't want to use any of these inputs. So we use the material functions to go and use all of these inputs. So what I want to do instead is I want to tell the material here to use material attributes. When I check this off, our now inputs are reduced to a single material attribute. So cool, that makes things a little bit easier. Let's go create our functions. So I'll type in func, and there's our material function call. And we'll create two of those since we have two material functions that we're going to be um, reproducing. And I'm going to create a scalar parameter like so. And this scalar parameter, we'll go and name this um, heat vision toggle. Okay, so this is what's going to turn on and off our heat vision. Let's take material number one and tell this to use our material function normal. And number two is going to be the material function thermal. So there are the two sets of textures that are going to live on this guy. And then our heat vision toggle is going to choose them. So to blend these two together, we, we can't use a lerp in this case. Um, you'll see that the material functions don't work with a lerp. So what we're going to do instead is I'm just going to type in simple in my search here. And what we're interested in is the material layer blend simple. So I'll go and plug these guys in. The base material is this normal material. The top material is going to be the thermal material. And the heat vision is going to determine which of these two things we see. The blended material then just goes into the material attributes. So if I save this now, like so, and close this. This hero material now needs to get assigned to this fella here. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and select him. I'm going to go edit his blueprints again. I'll go to the viewport. I'll select the mesh. I'll get out of rendering. And what I'm going to do is we're going to go look for there's the mesh there's the materials that's what i'm interested in so we're going to grab our new hero material and i'm going to plug the hero material into his texture all right so we're going to let this compile i'll actually compile the blueprint as we wait there we go so this is actually again because i didn't actually use his proper materials he's just now a flat gray fella um without his normal map which looks kind of crummy uh however uh, this is the regular version of him. And if we go into the hero material, and I'll just pull this out here so we can look at these two things uh, together. So here is our heat vision toggle. And if I set this to one, he's now using the second material. Set this back to zero, and he's back in his regular one. And what's really cool about this is we can actually do a blend of the two as well. Um, which is going to give us a, the ability to kind of really blend between those two things. Um, so let me set this to one so he's actually doing the right thing. And if you look at what's happening now, we're now getting that yellow color at his core and the red color around the perimeter. We're not quite there yet. Um, it is working a lot better than it was a moment ago. Uh, in fact, uh, if I go and set this toggle here back down to zero, You'll see that we, again, get that regular default style of rendering compared to this. Uh, I'm also going to go in just really quick uh, and grab his normal map. And uh, let's go and open up our functions. Um, so here's the thermal function and the normal function. Uh, and I'll grab his normal map, and I'm just going to bring it into the two of these things. Just so we're at least using his normal map here. So... Here's the normal map, which we'll plug into his normal. I'll save that one. Uh, and then, that's not the right one. This one can have a normal map as well. I don't need to make him look really terrible. Even if I'm not using his actual proper textures. Okay, um, so we'll leave this turned on like this. This is now going to be using the heat vision here, so it should be red around the perimeters and uh, whiter at the core. Um, let's save this. I 
and we'll let this uh, catch up. It's compiling the shaders as well here, so we'll let this finish what it's doing. There we are. Okay, so there's our thermal vision on him. You can see his normal map is back on now, so he doesn't look as crappy as he did a moment ago. And uh, what I want to do is I really want to play around with just how that gradient is working. So this is where um, those scalar parameters we plugged in are going to come into play. Now, what I'm going to need to do here, I'm going to take my hero material and I'm going to create an instance of it. And I'll call this MI for material instance and hero material, like so. So there's my uh, hero material. And what I'm going to do is go back into his blueprint. And uh, I'm going to swap out the material that he's currently using. So he's currently using the material, uh, the hero material. And what I'll do is I'll put my instance on instead. This is also why I like using that prefix. I can see MI here very clearly. So we'll compile this. And close this now the reason I want to do that um, is that this is going to allow me to if I go look over here there's my heat vision toggle which I can turn off and on which is good um, so I'll turn that let's reset it back to one so the heat vision is turned on now so I now actually have a scalar parameter that I can affect in a blueprint if I need to the other thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go and create a um, an instance of my um, thermal version vision that I made here. So this is the the actual post process material that we made, and it's full of parameters as well. Um, and in order to affect those parameters, we're going to create an instance of it. So this here will be mi thermal vision. Okay. So here's my post process volume. Here's my thermal vision mi, and we'll go find where this guy lives. search for material and we'll use the drop down here and we're going to be using mi thermal vision like so okay so what that's done is it's gone and swapped out uh which of the thermal visions is being used um next now i want to do this without him being selected and I'm, i want to show you why here when he's selected Remember that Unreal tints things to show you that selection. Well, that tint is affecting what we're seeing. See the difference between selected and not selected? So I want to make sure I'm looking at the not selected version of him here as I edit the, um, the material instance of his heat vision or his thermal vision material. Whoops, I'm going in. Made that too large. Okay, I'll pull this down. These are the only uh, values we need here. So these are the hot and cool parameters. Everything's set to one right now. There's also my ramp that we can go change in a moment. So what we'll do is we'll go play around with these values here and get something that looks really cool with this. So first, I think I want to knock back just how much red is appearing um, in the uh, the confines of the, uh, the cool. So if I go to the cool multiplier here, you can see that I can actually pull that up or pull it down, make it darker or lighter. Uh, and if I grab the cool power exponent, I can play around with where in the heat ramp those values are. You can see if I drop down below zero, we pop into the other um, the other spectrum. And so this gives us, again, a little bit of a fine uh, control over just what we're seeing in this ramp. I'm going to reset it back to its default. Uh, and let's go to the color multiplier here. You can see that I can also blow out the colors in his heat. Okay, So by grabbing that multiplier and pulling it up above one, we get a nice brighter version of this. Um, the other thing is the uh, hot powered exponent. If I grab this and I bring this up or down, you can see that we can play around with where in the ramp those values live. Now you can see that we probably want to stay shy of, it uh, looks like 1.9, 1.7, somewhere in there. You can see that we're actually starting to get gray in here. So it looks like at about a maximum 1.3 or so should be there. I can go and um, make that a value that's that's going to be capped out there but um, that looks pretty decent there I'm gonna go back into our uh, gradients here let's close this one I'm gonna leave this one open since it's the image size that I'm currently liking and let's go and drag in a couple more of these things so I really like the cool nature of this one uh, I really like the uh, is this the complementary one? Yeah, that's the complementary one that we're currently using. Um, so let's grab this one and this one. Let's pull these in. 
So what I'll do with these is just go and select a, again, if I can, a single pixel or close to it of this ramp, which I'll copy and I'll just close this and I'll paste that in here like so. I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to de de decrease the size of this thing so that I can see my transform lines here and I'll just transform it this way. I'm going to zoom in and I'll just rely on the snaps here in Photoshop to snap this to the right area. Oops. Come back up here. Okay, fine. That one there. That one there. Okay, let's try that again. Transform. I hit a shortcut somewhere and it snapped my rotation without my control. Okay, so now we'll bring these ones over to this side. And again, I'm making sure that uh, hot is on the left and uh, cool on the right. Again, we'll go do a little bit of a Gaussian blur on this um, to smooth it out a little bit. Cool, so there's another heat ramp. Let's go save that as a Targa. Um, and I'll just go and change the 1 to a 2. So we have thermal ramp number 2, like so. I'll go into this image, and we'll go grab a single pixel of this guy. Something like that. Okay, I'll paste this one in. So this one's kind of interesting in that it's got the... Um, and the hot and cool is different ranges here. We end up with blue is hot, which is uh, not something you see every day. And I'll go and apply my filter here. I'm just going to hit Control F to reproduce the filter. And I'll save this as a Targa. And we'll do number three. Now these are tiny little images. Uh, in fact, uh, they don't even need to be the 16 pixels high that I made them. I'm just doing that so that I can see them a little bit better. Uh, in actuality, really, a single pixel is all you need in height. Um, cool, so that's good. We've got two of them. Uh, I think let's just go make our own. So here we'll go into our, uh, our gradient ramp. And uh, I've actually got, look at this, all kinds of gradient ramps in here that we can use. Uh, this one looks like the, uh, the first one that we were playing around with. Here's one that's red and green. Um, so that's cool. Let me go and click on the green here, and we'll switch this green to like something icy blue. Cool, so now we've got red for hot in, uh, in there. Um, so I'm going to pull this down a little bit and add another one. And I'm going to make hot actually uh, a little bit more bright yellow. Cool. Uh, and I'm going to add another one over here, which will make this kind of a darker blue. Yeah, something like that. Uh, I think what I might want to do, let's see if we swap these order. And I add a black here at the end. Just so that it actually goes away. So I'm trying to get this point here to be exactly in the middle or something. Something of that nature. Anyway, I don't want to fill with this too much. I'm just going to go and gradient this across. Cool, there's my custom um, so I'll go and save this as a Targa, and we'll do number four. All right, uh, back into the world of Unreal. I'll grab these images here. Let's go to our texture library, and uh, let's bring that folder back up. And I'll grab my ramps. Uh, one is already in there, so we'll grab two through four, and I'll just pull them in here minimize that. Excellent. So there's ramps uh, 2, 3, and 4. So to apply these things, here's the custom ramp I made. I'll just go to my thermal com color ramp and swap it out. That's not too bad. I don't know that he reads hot uh, to me at the moment. I mean, it, it kind of reads a little bit hot, um, but the reds are so much darker than the blues uh, that it's not actually giving me that kind of effect. It, you can definitely see him standing out, especially if you were using this in a sniper rifle or something like that. You can really see where that guy is, um, but I'm not really liking the tones. Let's go try the uh, 
uh, monochromatic blue. That one's kind of interesting. So uh, this one appears to be using blues and very dark ranges here. Um, it doesn't really look good at all. And then we have this one. Oops, let's undo that. And so all of these things uh, could use, you know, a little bit of a uh, tweaking, you know, to get it to the point that it's exactly the effect you're looking for. You know, there's kind of a really nice blown out hot. Uh, and you can see it kind of fades to this little bit of a yellow here at the perimeter. Um, and the same thing with this one, you know, I can go and play around with where that cool point of this thing is so that it really feels cool out there. And then all of these things are going to have these values here that you can play with. So this monochromatic one, um, which looks really funny. I don't even see any of this yellow in the world here. Um, I think what happened is this got brought in as a normal map. Um, yeah, the, the engine thought it was a normal map. So I'm going to go switch this back to a default and save it, um, which was definitely the issue. There we go. Um, so yeah, so there you can see how that one works. Um, you know, a... Uh, just a different complete take on what thermal looks like uh, and again it's just a different type of rendering like it's still using the same uh, effect on each of these uh, meshes so the idea is with your game you can set this up so that your character looking through a sniper scope or something of that nature can actually swap between the four different versions of this um, allowing you to get very different effects um, all the way through, which is really kind of a cool thing. And they're all done with the switch of a button. So again, this is a uh, just a, an image swap. And so it's giving us a very great amount of control over, uh, over the effect. There. That feels a little bit more like heat fission. And so anyway, you've got a fine level of control over each of these things, which is really cool. Okay, that's it for now. I'm going to save all. And uh, I'll go and save my current project as well. Um, in the next video, what we're going to be taking a look at doing is adding a footprint to the ground as the character walks around. Uh, that, that too, is going to be done with the thermal scope and, uh, or the thermal vision. Uh, and they'll fade out over time. So as the player walks around, uh, we'll get fading footprints. So you can actually kind of track where enemies have gone in the world by watching their footprints. See you next time.